Hey folks, greetings from the Offensive Security Group here at Secure IT 360, coming at you with a new episode of the Cyber Threat Perspective. You've got Mr. Spencer here and myself, Brad. Um, today we're talking about um, how attackers are targeting law firms, right? And how to detect, prevent, you know, kind of all of those moving parts with regards to that. Uh, you know, this is fresh on our minds because we're coming back from legal sec in Baltimore, which was super cool. We'll talk more about that, but uh, quick admin, as always, if you find this stuff useful, please subscribe, rate, like, share, all that good stuff. Um, it's it's really a big help to us and, and helps us get the word out of what we're doing here. So um, so legal sec, for those, of, yeah. those that are not in the legal community or those who are unfamiliar. Yeah, legal sec is... Uh a event that ILTA puts on and ILTA is the International Legal Technology Association. So if you're in legal IT, you're an IT manager or a CIO, you do security, you're a network engineer uh, at a law firm or somebody who deals with law firms, you probably have heard that name. Well, ILTA is a pretty big organization uh, and LegalSec is kind of their premier cybersecurity conference specifically targeted for law firms, for legal IT folks. Uh, they have another conference called ILTACON, which is a much larger conference, and it kind of covers the whole gamut of legal. Uh, so you have, you know, everybody from, you know, knowledge management and intake uh, all the way through IT and project management uh, in kind of everywhere in between at ILTACON. And that's a much bigger event, tens of thousands of people. Uh, ILTACON is, or sorry, LegalSec is much smaller. It's much more niche to cybersecurity legal IT. Um, but it's great because everybody there kind of talks the talk, right? They all speak this, the language that we're speaking. So when we talk about pen testing and, you know, APIs and, um, you know, vulnerabilities, uh, they don't look at us cross-eyed because that's stuff that they do every day, all day, right? They're doing vulnerability management. They're doing asset inventory and all that good stuff uh, at LegalSec. So that's LegalSec. That's kind of what it was. Uh, you and I were both speaking at LegalSec last week, uh, and you know we had really great interactions with with the folks there. Mm -hmm. um, really great questions. Uh, I thought everything went really well, and it was really awesome to see uh, everybody kind of, you know, looking forward and and trying to, um, you know, advance their understanding of attacks, threat actors, best practices. Uh, and the like. So that's kind of where we're at today, uh, and kind of why we want to have this. Uh, podcast itself is, you know, we talk to a lot of people at LegalSec. Um, some of them are more mature in their security programs than others. Yeah. But one thing is similar is that they're all law firms, right? And they have a lot of similarities with how attackers are kind of going after them. Uh, and then, you know, how do we detect and prevent that? Uh, you know, how do we how do we keep our law firms secure and and not ransomed and and all that good stuff? So. Yeah. It kind of sets the stage a little bit. Anything I missed out, Brad? No, not really. Uh, I think you covered it all really well. You know, one of the things um, that places us uniquely in a position to have this conversation is um, probably somewhere around 50% of our client base in the pen testing world, in our security operations center, and our ISO group is uh, our law firms. And so I'm not even really sure why it happened that way, but somehow, you know, we just kind of, I guess our message resonated really well over the last 10 or so years with law firms. And so, um, so we work with them a lot and it's one of the reasons we're involved in ILTA. It's one of the reasons that we're involved in LegalSec um, is not necessarily because law firms are significantly unique in the threats that they face, which we're going to talk about, uh, but because we are intimately involved in that, that market vertical. You know, and yep. and so we're just just happen to be that group, and so um, you know we we're kind of among peers and and friends when we're at these these legal security yep. conferences. So we make an extra effort to attend and participate whenever we can. Yep. Um, and it was kind of cool too. You know, at LegalSec, just a, qu a quick sidebar is uh, Secure IT three hundred and sixty. Like you said, has been around the legal space for a while. Um, you know, David Forstall. CEO of Secure IT 360 uh, has has made a lot of relationships in the legal world, mm -hmm. and it was fun to go to the conferences uh, like this and say, "Oh yeah, I know, I know Secure IT 360. I know you guys, you know." And yeah. it's kind of nice, you know, being at a company where people kind of recognize that they recognize the work and the craftsmanship that in the, the effort and the customer service and all that. Um, 
But then also there was a few people who were like, yeah, I never heard you guys. And I'm like, yeah. awesome. <laughs> Let me tell you how awesome we are. Exactly. Um, <laughs> so a little humble brag, you know, about Secure IT 360 um, in, in the legal space, but uh, we're really passionate about this and, and we love what we do. Um, and uh, legal is a big vertical, vertical for us. We understand it well. Uh, and that's what we're going to talk about today. It is, yeah. And and so, you know, one of the things that came up in my talk, uh, we, we had a panel of, of basically me and then a bunch of blue team guys, right? And these were really seasoned, experienced blue team guys from all, you know, all areas, right? We had an FBI dude, we had CrowdStrike there, you know, so, so we had some big players in the legal defense game. And I think the, the kind of universal opinion that came from us is that law firms are not uniquely targeted, meaning that there are not threat actors out there using specifically oriented TTPs to attack firms. You know, in most cases, they were either um, peripheral, you know, like somebody picked them up by mistake, or they are targeted, but not using anything that's completely new, unique, or out of the ordinary. And so, one of the things that we did talk about, and, I, and I'm skipping around a little bit on our agenda here because I, I want to talk about what sets law firms apart from other types of market verticals, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and there are two things come to mind. Um, first of all, the fact that they have access to a large breadth of information. So yeah. if, I am a, if I'm a firm representing, say I'm a, um, a copyright firm or a firm who, who deals in patents, um, you know, there, the amount of information I have in my, you know, document management system is, is huge. It's important. There's a lot of value there, monetary value specifically. Even if I am just a family law firm, right? The people that I work with, the information about them is super sensitive, you know? Yeah. Uh, so, so, so they have that going for them. Um, and then, and then I want to talk about the like law firms on the websites or the law, uh, the practitioners on the websites, but go ahead. I yep. want to pass it off to you first. Yeah. And it was just going to, uh, carry on that thought of, you know, even smaller law firms in, in, in cities and stuff like that, they're going to have, uh, prominent people in the, uh, in the area that are their mm -hmm. clients, right? Like government officials, um, mayors, you know, politicians, um, prominent people in industry in certain geographic regions, right? So not even just thinking like the big, big companies, but you know, there's there's a lot of information there, and and threat actors realize that there are uh, law firms that are doing mergers and acquisitions and stuff like that, and they're gonna ha they're gonna be privy to a lot of that information as part of their discovery uh, process. Um, yeah. So yeah, I just wanted to to, to dovetail on that. No, that's a really good point. And, um, you know, they're also uniquely impacted, you know, so, so let, let's, let's also go ahead and put this out there that, you know, the vast majority of attacks against firms, you know, really kind of fall into two categories, right? Ransomware extortion and, and also BEC business email compromise to, to, um, to, to take money. And, and I want to talk about the ransomware extortion thing for a second. And, and it is, it's uniquely impactful to them for the following reason. I choose who I do business with in the legal space, right? If, if, if my firm that I normally do business with is compromised, it is potentially in fact impactful to my reputation. And, and when, when you live in the legal space, your reputation is everything, right? So the success that you have in litigation and your rep is huge. It's what carries your firm forward. And so, you know, it's different than like if a hospital gets hit by ransomware, like, yes, you know, it's going to impact patient care. Yes, it's going to give them a, a bad reputation. But dude, when you're in a car accident, you're not like, no, don't take me to that hospital. I heard they got ransomware. You know what I mean? And, and it's right. the same with like Amazon or something. If they get ransomware, you're like, wow, am I going to get my package on time? Like you're not thinking I'm going to go do business somewhere else. So the reputational impact of a serious security incident at a law firm could be um, significantly detrimental to their future. Right. Um, and so, so yeah, so that's one unique, I think maybe, maybe not unique across all, but unique across some, um, and then, uh, talk about their, uh, the fact that they like to put all their stuff on their websites. Yeah. And that's, um, <laughs> that's where we get into kind of the opportunistic stuff, um, yeah. or, you know, there might be uh, a situation right where, uh, a prominent attorney or something like that is in the news, uh, mm -hmm. for a case that they just 
uh, finished or something like that, or a big merger and acquisition where they were, you know, the, the attorneys involved and, you know, you go to the website for these attorneys and in, in these law firms and, you know, they want to show off their attorneys, right? They're prominent people. They have industry awards, you know, they speak, um, they have a lot of credentials, right? That they want to show off. Yeah. Like they went to Harvard or, you know, they have a, a very, um, a storied resume, yeah. right? So naturally law firms want to use that as marketing in sales to, to get new clients and stuff like that, which is great. Uh, the only, I don't want to say only, but one of the downsides, right? Is that information is all available to attackers, uh, and anybody else who wants to look at it. Yeah. And what we find is that there is, uh, a lot of information on these attorneys websites or law firm websites, you know, we're talking email address of how to reach them, the phone number, um, where they went to college, their degree that they got, the awards they got. And that's great. Uh, but just know that, you know, that it, that can be used against you in certain yeah. ways, right? If I'm an attacker, if I'm trying to social engineer someone or fish someone, that's great information for me to use to create a believable pretext. Right, like, oh, I want to give this attorney an award, and they have to download the form and you know fill it out and send it back, and they won an award. You know, you're playing on kind of their uh, the ego and the relationship or the personality of the person um, to get access to that environment. So that information is great, uh, but it can be used against uh, against you uh, in terms of uh, you know developing some sort of believable you know con to get yeah. somebody to click on something or download something or do something that you want. Sure. And so I'll tell you, you know, just straight up when we're doing external pen testing on law firms, one of the first things we do on the first half of the first day is we go to their website and we have scripts that we've written that, that basically pull down uh, all of their information. Right. So even if they don't have email address, just first name, last name, once we understand email format, which yep. is incredibly easy to figure out, um, then, you know, we can build a user list to log into things. Yep. And so, you know, yeah, it, it, we, we love it um, because it makes our job so much easier. Yep. You know, we don't have to rely on compromised databases of user accounts. We don't have to rely on, you know, Google or anything like that. We literally go to their website. And we're like, oh, cool, man. I see you have uh, 1,200 attorneys across the world. I'm going to download all of their information. And I, I now have, you know, a user yep. list to spray or, or, or to, to, you know, try to log yep. in with. We do that every time and, yeah, and I and, guarantee you we're not unique. Yeah, no, um, not at all. And, and the interesting thing about this too is, you know, raise your hand uh, if you're listening or watching, right? raise your hand if the username for your environment is the same as the email address, right? The first part, yeah. right? That's very common to see the username being the email, the same as the email, right? Same as the UPN. Uh, yeah. And so the reason that's valuable is we can go to third party websites that don't take an email address, right? But take a username mm -hmm. and log in with those same, same accounts. SSL VPNs. You know? um, exactly. All kinds of stuff, man. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, one of the other obvious, you know, you were talking about believable social engineering campaigns against people because of the information they put out there, but we can also leverage, um, you know, public databases, right? So we, we look out there and we see some guy named Jim Jones who graduated from Harvard. I can go find out when he graduated. That's public information. And so, you know, just bouncing that off of free user databases, I can tell you the street he probably live, lives on, the office he works out of and where he graduated. And from that, I can create a, a pretty convincing uh, password list, yep. right? That, that can then be used to spray against that account. And so, yep. you know, I understand the need to give that information out, but in my opinion, uh, and it's worth exactly what you paid for it, right? Um, yep. My opinion, it is one of the larger exposures that that we see that is yep. unique to law firms. Yep. And I think I think part of the defensive uh, in-depth strategy for that is one, knowing it, right? No, one, realizing that there's information like that out there mm -hmm. uh, and knowing how it's used, right? Knowing how attackers are going to create word lists, um, how they're going to look for those emails, how they're going to use those emails. So that's, you know knowing that it's out there uh, and how attackers are going to be using that stuff and targeting it. And then two, um, how, how to defend against that, yeah. you know, um, and, and that's kind of, you know, the second half of this episode is, you know, understanding what type of attacks are out there, how law firms are targeted and what, what you can do about it. Right. Sure. So one of the, one of my things that I would recommend uh, when it comes to kind of OSINT and stuff like that 
is, and you've got, you know, some history with this too, Brad, in, in finance with, you know, cloning websites and stuff like that, um, that I think is, is relevant to this conversation. But what I think is, is kind of interesting is setting up Canary accounts or Canary yes. emails, right? Create a fake persona on LinkedIn or create some fake email addresses that when they get emailed, those, you know, they're not real people. Uh, they're not in use. So you know, you can immediately, um, you know, block list, block those emails at your email filter at your edge and, and you're good to go. Um, that can be a good early warning sign of, of spam campaigns, social yep. engineering, phishing, all that sort of stuff. Um, and it's free and easy to do. And there's tons of examples like that. Mm -hmm. um, everything from cloning websites to, um, you know, documents that you can put online. You know, you could create fake PDFs online to put and put fake metadata in there. Mm -hmm. And you know that if somebody's crawling that metadata and they're looking for an email and then they're password spraying that email or trying to log in with that email, you know that that's no good because you planted that. Yep. Um, so there's a lot of stuff you can do with deception and, and kind of stuff like that on the blue team side. Um, and it's kind of just thinking like an attacker, but thinking how you would do it, uh, how you would trap someone if you were yep. intentionally trying to, to do certain things. So those are the kind of things that I would recommend looking into um, that immediately come to mind. Yeah, without a doubt, dude. So w one of the things that we used to do was embed fake account numbers in GitHub repos. So if if we if we discovered that there were GitHub repos out there that had some of our information on it, we would branch and then we would we would commit uh, and, and we would watch for threat actors that tried to leverage those account numbers to either like open mortgage accounts or to register an online banking profile or anything like that. Yeah. Um, and, and you'd be surprised, you know, we would start seeing people come out of the woodwork from like other countries. And then we would say, okay, we can tell by that behavior, it's that threat actor. This is where they're based out of, you know, you know, now we're just going to geo nuke that entire area. Yep. Um, but, but yeah, look, man, you, anybody that's been listening to this show for, for very long knows that we're huge fans of, of canaries. Uh, we're, we're huge fan of, of deception and, and misdirection, especially on the blue side, because it is uniquely, um, reliable in its success rate mm -hmm. with, you know, without false positives. Right. Yep. Um, somebody didn't accidentally try to log into your O365 or M365 environment uh, with that with that email address. They are malicious. There's no yep. question. Right. Yeah. You kind of turn you turn the tides, essentially, uh, so to speak, on the adversary and, and you, you put them on the back foot. You know, you you are ne they're now operating on your turf and they're not kind of operate. They're not operating as, as free will as, as they would like to. Yeah. And once they realize that there's canaries in place. You know, a lot of other people talk about this too. Is one, once they realize that there are canaries, there are kind of some traps in place, um, it's it's going to cause some hesitation, Yeah, right? I it know for me- when find somebody else. Yeah, exactly. And I know when I'm pen testing and I see uh, canary files, or if I see something that I suspect is maybe a trap, it does make me stop and think and yeah. takes more time. Um, and It'll you're slow always you down. Wondering, yeah, it, it slows them down. And it creates more opportunities for them to make mistakes and then ultimately get detected, right? Yep. The more, the more cycles you make them spend, the more steps they have to take, the more likely that they're going to trip up, cause an alert, do something that that's going to get them detected and, and hopefully evicted after that. And, and that's kind of the, the goal of defense in depth in, in my mind. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah, man. None of this stuff's hundred percent. All we want to do is create enough trouble for yep. them that they just can't move around undetected or, or, or just yeah. make it difficult, you know? Uh, now I will say that, that setting up detections for canaries and all of that, that can be a complex process on the back end, Right. Um, mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, if you don't have a lot of security staff, there are still other things you can do. Right. And so you've actually got a list here of some really cool things that, um, are technology oriented, like email security stuff, or, you know, just monitoring internal external attack surface, things like that. You want to just touch on some of those? Cause I think they're really good. Yeah, definitely. So, you know, this goes back to a lot of the blocking and tackling that we talk about all the time. Um, I think user awareness is important, right? Um, you know, educating users on what suspicious stuff looks like and, and, and what to be aware of. Um, and then you mentioned reviewing your attack surface, right? It doesn't have to be a complicated like a tech surface management platform and, and product and all that stuff. You could do it yourself. You could just 
regularly re review your external footprint, right? Um, regularly review what services you have on, open on the internet, what, uh, what websites you have available, what domains, um, stuff like that. Um, and, and the same goes with the information that you have, you know, all that information's on your website, uh, reviewing it on a regular basis, see if you're expo accidentally exposing anything that you, uh, didn't know you were, uh, are, are yeah. two big things and you can have an external pen test done. You could do this yourself. There's a lot of ways you can monitor for stuff. Um, this also kind of dovetails into impersonation. So if somebody creates a, a lookalike domain, right, is that something that you're going to uh, be able to identify? Uh, is that something they have a, a process to, to identify? Uh, there's a lot of email security products that will kind of help with some of that uh, and kind of um, enterprise defense products and things like that. But just looking at, you know, uh, various permutations of your domain and seeing if they're registered, seeing if there's certificates created for them, uh, could be a good way to detect some of that stuff. Yeah, I agree with that. And, you know, the biggest thing, and I know I've harped on it a million times, but your asset management program says more about the future success of your security program than anything else you could possibly do. Knowing what you have and knowing what its status is and who owns it um, yeah. is, is the cornerstone and foundation of your app site or not app site, but your, your security program in general, like you can't patch it. You can't vulnerability scan it. If you don't know you have it yep. um, and, and the number of external pen tests that we do, and probably you two on internals, right? Where yep. you find something and you're like, oh man, I thought we turned that off and it hasn't seen a patch in eight months because yep. it was supposed to be turned off, but nobody found it. And so, I mean, you know, the yeah. number of problems that can be solved before they ever happen just by keeping keep an eye on what you have outside and inside. Yeah. Or, and that's why we uh, pen huge. test, right? It's, you know, the, the defense, the IT team, they turn on a control, they implement something, they enable something, they configure something, they check it, they make sure it looks good. And then you pen test for QA, right? You pen test to make sure that you, what you expected to be there, what you expected to be in place is there and it's, it's working as you uh, had intended or had designed. Yep. Uh, and so, you know, as close to, you know, as, as far as you can get your maturity of your security program up to and including things like application control, the better off you're going to be to kind of be resilient against uh, these these attacks. Um, All right, so, so question on that, right? So um, I, I think we understand what BEC is, business email compromise, where I'm, I'm social engineering yep. you into making wire transfers or changing invoices and, and stealing money from your organization or on behalf of your organization to another organization, right? That's how BEC works. I think we yep. all understand um, that, you know, how that process works. There's not a lot of technical controls that it can exist there other than strong email security, but let's talk about ransomware extortion, okay? To me, a lot of that begins on the endpoint. The, yep. the, the, the access method for that, I think we even talked about it in the, in the, in the talk, you know, last week yep. was, you know, RDP to the internet, with weak credentials, right? Or, or SSL VPNs with weak credentials. So let's, yep. dude, that's just a duh for me. Yep. It's like, guys, MFA, everything, you know, strong passwords, everything. So, so I'm going to set that aside for a second. Let's talk about endpoints because I think people are buying EDR and XDR and they're, they're checking the box and they're moving on. And yep. that's not the end game here. So tell us about like, okay, I feel like I'm a mature firm. What are my next steps to ensure that my endpoints are as strong as I want them to be? Yeah. So one of the things that, that threat actors are going to do is they need credentials, right? They, they need to, once they land on a machine, they've got their initial foothold. Um, they've got some persistence set up. They're going to be looking for credentials so that they can get as high level of access as they can so that they can ransom the environment or do whatever it is they want to do. Uh, in specifically when we're talking about ransomware, they want to affect as many machines in the environment as they can. So they want to get domain admin or equivalent in the environment, right? And there's a number of ways to do that. But the things that help uh, with kind of mitigating that or being resilient to that are things like application control, um, blocking the mounting of ISO files, which is the precursor to a lot of that initial access stuff. So they'll drop ISO files that uh, unpackaged to zip files and these N Allen K files. And, and eventually it, it calls, you know, their malware. Um, so application control is really good. And if you can get to a position where you have application control, um, in, uh, 
not in audit mode, but in, you know, uh, actually running and implemented, uh, that can be a really significant control or really significant defense against that stuff. Um, but just regularly reviewing endpoints as well. Um, you know, patching third-party software, you know, Zoom in, um, you know, Adobe in Java and all that other stuff that has is commonly exploited, um, you know, is, is an important thing to consider yeah. and, and to do. Um, and then the thing that I love that all the time is PowerShell. You know, PowerShell is still he being heavily abused, held heavily used by threat actors, especially ransomware operators um, for everything from enumeration and, you know, account discovery, but also for execution and downloading, uh, you know, their malicious payloads and things like that. So having good PowerShell restrictions and monitoring for suspicious power PowerShell can go a long way as well. Um, and, and those are some of the things that I think are, are most important on the endpoint. Yeah, no, I agree 100% with all that. You know, I think I think application control, application whitelisting. Uh, there's another term that we heard used. Uh, it was like app, yeah, app locking, Windows, Windows Defender, Application Guard. Yeah, so so implementing that is kind of what we see as the holy grail of endpoint security, right? It, it's not again, there is no silver bullet to anything. It's all about a defense in depth. But at an endpoint level, implementing that alongside PowerShell monitoring. And and I agree with you on the on the restrictions thing. That's going to be a huge variable because it's, some people rely on that heavily for admin stuff. So I understand that there's only so much you can do there, but you yep. can monitor everything, right? There's yep. no reason that you can't you know spin up alerts and have custom rules associated with malicious PowerShell scripts because there are yep. a lot of uh, kind of universal ways to detect that. But the the point that I want to get at though is you know if you can set that as a goal. You know, you can be part of the one or two percent of firms who are really up there, absolutely rocking and rolling. And so, you know, um, you know, I would encourage people to look at that. When we were kind of like polling in our in our talks at LegalSec, I think there was like one firm that had application whitelisting that was not in audit mode, like it was enforcing yep. the policy. You know, and the, the dude was just like, yeah, man, we totally do that. And we're all like, whoa, that's amazing. So, you know, that just tells you it's tough. I understand that. I don't disagree with you. And there were, by the way, a lot of excuses as to why people couldn't do it. But it comes down to, you know, and this is something I used to teach my kids all the time was like, everything is doable. It just depends on how motivated you are and how important it is to yep. you. Yep. Right. Because you can do it. Yep. It, might, it might hurt a little bit. But you can yeah, do and you know we see this all the time when we do uh, come in and do an ISO assessment, right? When we do our 360 assessment and we look at the whole firm and we look at governance and risk yeah. and all these different areas, and we see a lot of times there is a lack of support for IT and security. There's a lack of governance. There's a lack of responsibility, and it's a lot of times IT and security just by themselves trying to do what they can. Yeah, uh, and that comes along with thing. it too. You know that that that's a big component of it as well. Um, and the other thing I'll say is you know. The reason we do this stuff, the reason we talk about this stuff is to kind of check our assumptions, right? For example, I was doing a pen test. Uh, the organization was using LAPS, which is Microsoft's local admin password solution, which randomizes see. the password uh, for the local admin account, all the systems that it's deployed on. Mm -hmm. um, so they had deployed that. They've had it deployed for a while. I got access to the local admin password on one host. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I said, oh, they have LAPS. They, they, probably aren't using this password anywhere, right? But let me try it just in case. Yep. And sure enough, there was a half a dozen, uh, 10, 12, something like that systems that uh, that local admin password was being used for the local admin account. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's why we do stuff like that is to check yeah. our assumptions, to make sure that we're implementing things the right way, completely all the way, that kind of thing. Yep. Um, so that's part of the defense mindset too, is kind of checking your assumptions of, of what you expect is in place with what's actually in place. Um, but yeah, to your point, Brad, uh, and to kind of round out that statement is it's hard. It's not easy. A lot of this stuff uh, technically is easy to understand, um, but implementing it, getting buy-in and, you know, especially for larger teams that have big change control and there's different people responsible for different things. Uh, it can be, it can definitely be frustrating to get some of the stuff implemented, yeah. uh, but it is worthwhile. Uh, we hear time and time again that firms who implement these things uh, notice a, a significant increase in their defense, in their security posture because yeah. of it.
Agreed. And, and, you know, that's one of the things that you can, that we really love about doing pen testing is you can't cheat that, right? If we show up to an internal pen test and your internal controls are crap, you can't hide it, bro. We are going to, we're going to find all those things and, and, and your, your pen test report is going to be super ugly. And so, um, you know, at some point, everything's going to come back to haunt you if you don't make that leadership investment in, in both effort and time. Uh, and, and of course, you know, money, nothing, nothing's, yep. you know, free these days, it seems like, but you know, the, the point is this, right. Establishing a security culture is probably, you know, a big part of the reason that we see some firms succeed in, in security and some, some firms not. Um, but, but there are still a lot of really good strategies that you can employ that aren't expensive, that don't require a ton of leadership involvement. Um, you know, which is why we wanted to do this podcast today. Yeah. So. Cool. Well, folks, that's all we have time for today. If you enjoyed this episode, uh, share it with your friends and colleagues. That's the best way to help us out. Check us out over at offsec.blog. Uh, we'll be posting this along with a whole bunch of other really cool stuff over there as well. Um, and we'll see you next week.